My name's first on the program, so I guess we'll call the Central Kansas Water Bank meeting to order, and Daryl will call the uh, regular meeting to order for the GMD annual meeting. I want to welcome everybody tonight to our annual meeting, and uh, we've got some good people here we want to hear from. They're sitting right over there, so without any further ado, I'll put Orrin on. Thanks, Daryl. Um, before we get going tonight, I wanted to make special recognition of a loss to our, our region, our community uh, this week. If you're not aware, uh, former Representative Greg Lewis passed on Monday. Uh, so if we could kind of keep that family in our prayers uh, as we move throughout this evening and, and throughout the, uh, the rest of the course of our discussions. Um, Like we've done in past years, the annual meeting minutes, um, they were approved at our board meeting for GMD5 last March. And so I'd encourage you to go ahead and take a look at what we discussed last year at our annual meeting. We do have those uh, in the packet if you'd like to, to review them, but we're not gonna have to do anything about approving them or anything like that tonight because they're already been reviewed by the respective boards and approved. Uh, so that saves us quite a bit of time as well. Um, let's go ahead and kick off and let's get going on down into the agenda. I do, I'm going to make a few modifications to it tonight to add a few folks that, that were able to make it um, to add them on, but I'll, I'll do that on the fly as we get going. So without further ado, Andrew, are you ready? We're going to do the water bank uh, election here. We have two positions, uh, Curtis Tobias and Vernon Hertz. Uh, any nominations from the floor? Uh, any other, any nominations from the floor? Uh, uh, any nominations from the floor? Second. All those in favor say aye. positions for the GMD-5 board uh, and there's nobody for Rice County right now so somebody be thinking about thinking they'd like to be a board member from Rice County in Barton County we have Phil Martin and would there be any nominations from the floor okay better better uh, would there be any nominations from the floor for Barton County? Okay. And in Edwards County, Darrell Wood is the incumbent. Would there be any nominations from the floor? Anybody decided they'd like to run for Rice County? Boy, everybody's really eager tonight. <laughs> well, I guess, could we entertain a motion for a unanimous ballot for the candidates? Okay, I guess we took care of that in our short order. Oh, we got a vote. Everybody's been so busy participating <laughs> uh, all in favor Aye. opposed 
I guess we got her done now. Just so everybody's aware, uh, with Big Ben's bylaws, we do, the board will uh, make an attempt to fill the Rice County vacancy uh, at our next board meeting in March uh, from eligible voters from Rice County. Uh, so you guys need to start racking the bushes and trying to find someone that'll run and serve in that position. Um, with that, and moving on, we'll go ahead and have our financial update from our treasurer, John Jansen. And if any of you are hard of seeing like I am, some of these things could be in bigger print. Uh, in, in your handout, you have a 2020 budget and then the proposed budget for 2021. Uh, if you look at them, they're basically identical. And then one page down, you'll find this summary or the summary that was up here originally of the annual budget over the prior several years. Uh, the 2020 budget has already been adopted and the 2021 budget is basically an FYI that we don't have to vote on it, but it's so you can kind of see where we're headed. Uh, as we anticipate the way things are headed with the uh, Quiveria issues and the things we need to do to provide remediation, uh, we're trying to get ahead enough cash to be able to do parts of it and eventually uh, there will be other funding necessary but at least we're gathering up some cash to get it put together and uh, so that's that's the nature of the budget that you see here are there questions I'm lucky Fred they're participating here just as much as they did in the elections so we're all right anything else you would like me to do just Oh, the final, we'll have an actual approval of the 20, 2021 budget at our July annual meeting. So if you think about it between now and then and you don't like something or you'd like us to do it different, be sure you at least show up there. So that's, that's where we're at. Well, since you guys did not participate in some of those activities, you guys get to listen to me drone on for a while. Um, I'm going to briefly go over several topics going on in the district. Um, we do have some folks in the room that will be able to discuss some other things. But uh, as usual, I, I like showing these slides showing where we've been. This is the drought monitor from last, this time last year. You don't want color on this map. So accordingly, of course, it's very clear of color. We are very wet this time last year. Contrast it to now, we have a little bit of concern uh, coming through here, uh, just out to the southeast of us. Um, John does an excellent job of going out and collecting water level measurements throughout the year. John Hildebrand, yes. Sorry, John. Too many Johns in my life. Um, that could be out of context. Um, John does a great job. Uh, <laughs> let's keep on moving. The uh, complete distracting. No, thanks. Um, he, he collects water level measurements throughout the year, but in January, he collects a whole lot more. And in conjunction with the Kansas Geological Survey, uh, Division of Water Resources, uh, they all collect a lot of samples. Uh, this was the change in water level between 2018 to 19. You want blue on these maps, okay? Blue is good, means water level is coming up. Red means the water level is going down. I don't expect everybody to see what these numbers are on this screen because I know they are very small. Contrast that to right now from 2019 to 20. This is in your handout. Um, there's more red than last year, but don't misconstrue that. If you'll notice, 
this time last year, those, many of those red spots were very, very high, at record level highs. And in October, John was telling me that these spots were higher than normal in October, and they're along the streams, in, in the alluvial aquifers. And so in that three-month period between October and January, most likely what we believe is happening is that that water table is just rebounding and, and settling back down. And so you see a net change of negative, but it's still very, very high. Because if we look, it's not in this, but you have it in your, in your handouts, the actual depth to water uh, for the area. You'll notice those water levels are still very high. As Vernon loves to say, I agree with him, you cannot fill a full bucket. There's only so much water you can put into this area. And so we are very blessed to have a very rapid recharge rate with a very shallow soil that's overlain with a lot of sands. That equates to, to rapid recharge, and we do see that quite frequently. Uh, any questions on the, on the data set and kind of how this is compiled throughout the year? Because I'm about to bore the pants off you uh, as we get into the actual projects and issues. Okay. Uh, starting off with GMD5, number one on the list, no surprise, the Quivira National Wildlife Impairment Complaint. Uh, still ongoing, and I'll get into more details soon about that. I'll, I'll circle back to this at, at the end of my uh, discussion. Uh, but I will say this, we are working directly with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in putting together a uh, remedy that is sustainable, that is long-lasting, and mutually agreed upon. Is that, would that be an accurate statement, Will? Okay. Uh, I do want to mention we do have some dignitaries in the room. Uh, Will Meeks with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service out of Denver. You're welcome, Will. Uh, Mike Oldham with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife out of, at, he's the manager at Cuvira. And then Craig, I'm going to miss your last name, Maori, I knew it, out of Flint Hills uh, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They're here tonight to, to answer any, any specific questions you may have. But be aware, I'm going to, we're going to have questions later on about, about this. So, so please hold those for a little bit. Uh, as well as uh, with Senator Moran's office, we have Tyler York, and then we have Katie Sawyer with uh, Representative Marshall's office. I get it. Um, all right, and then uh, City, I know I'm glossing over stuff, guys. Uh, City of Hayes and Russell, the R9 Ranch, at this point is still in judicial review by, with WaterPAC and the Division of Water Resources. I don't have a significant update because GMD5 is not a party in that process, but it is an ongoing issue. It's not yet resolved. If you've been watching the news and the press releases over the last two months, you might have seen a bulletin go out saying that Great Bend Prairie Aquifer is highly contaminated. That's what the press like to say. I, it's hard to contradict that because they do cite real data. What, went on is we participated in a water quality assessment through John maybe 15 wells or so to assess the nitrate level nitrate concentration in the groundwater in southern Stafford County and Reno County the nitrate levels are very elevated but it was not a chicken little type of assessment the intent behind the assessment from our point of view was to highlight the need for further study and to highlight the need for individual well owners, whether it be domestic, irrigation, stock water, you need to be out there checking your well, checking your water quality to make sure that what you're putting in your, your body, in your stock, whatever it may be, is not harmful to you. Nitrates are on the rise. We need to be aware of that. I would say that in the coming years, water quality is going to be a much bigger monster than what we may be dealing with water quality or water quantity. Okay, so, so be, on the, be on the look for that. That is going to be on the, on the horizon for further study. Um, conservation programs. There are several that are, that are hot off the press that I want to bring to your attention. The first one is the uh, CIG program. You'll see some of the, some of the participants are partners on the bottom of the screen with their logos. I always hesitate to put logos on screen because inevitably you forget somebody. But this is my attempt. Uh, we have K-State, Waterpack, TNC, and, the, and NRCS going together on this. 
this opportunity would provide a 50% cost share for soil moisture probes, mobile drip irrigation, and other types of technology uh, for a real world on the farm assessment uh, throughout the Rattlesnake Creeks region. 50% cost share, that's pretty good. I encourage you if you have any questions or concerns to, to hit up TNC uh, or NRCS office, they'll be happy to, to help you get into that program. And we'll be having some workshops and assistance coming up here this, this spring. Uh, I believe it was funded um, a little over $1 million over the next three years. So it's a pretty good little program. Okay. For out of fight removal, uh, we're still pushing for this. There's a lot of logos on the bottom of that screen. That should highlight to you how important this is for this region. Um, so far, They've removed about 6,500 ac acres of phreatophytes uh, and a, about 1,000 acres of wetlands on 30 stream miles. 30 stream miles in the Rattlesnake Creek is not very far because, as you guys are aware, Rattlesnake Creek loves to oxbow and bend around. Uh, I'm not fully up to speed about how, exactly how far upstream and linear mileage that is, but it's less than you would think. Uh, if you have concerns or want to be a part of that, you can contact Aaron Flanders with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Partners Program, uh, Heidi Mel with TNC, or Matt Huff with Ducks Unlimited. They're the principal folks that are getting people signed up. Again, that's for Rattlesnake Creek. Brand new. We just found out about this late last week or so. Uh, and I'm kind of looking through the crowd at, at Rita. Uh, Shards with NRCS because she brought this to my attention. Uh, the application deadline for this irrigation technology initiative is March 6, so not March 6, 2021. It's in a couple weeks. So if you have any interest in this, you need to be going to talk to Tarita and her group. Uh, 75,000 is designated to Rattlesnake Creek region with a 70% cost share for soil moisture probes. Uh, limited to three automated soil moisture probes per, per landowner and a cap of $10,000 per landowner. Uh, so be aware of that. that. That's a pretty good little program. If you're interested in getting soil moisture probes out there, they must be automated. They can't be manual soil moisture probes. They have to be automated. Okay. And Rita is the expert on this one. She, she told me she just got back from a, a big presentation about it today. So she's the expert. All right. Switch over to Water Bank. Uh, Water Bank, we are still in the process of being reviewed by a review committee. This slide is a direct clone from last year. We're still in that review process. Okay, I was not aware this slide was going to be popping up, but it's okay. Uh, the five-year review is required by statute. It has independent review committee made up of state agencies, water right holders, GMD representatives, universities, economists, and lawyers. I always have to have the lawyers in there. Uh, to make sure that we as a water bank are staying consistent with state and, and local rules. Uh, they evaluate the positive and negative impacts to the hydrology and whether the, the charter should lapse or, or move forward. Uh, within a year, in this case two years, they're to submit a report of its evaluation to the governor, to the water office, water authority, secretary of agriculture, chief engineer, and the Senate standing committee on the committee of environment. At this point, this review is in draft phase, and we just received the very first draft of it today, and it'll be reviewed by that committee uh, next Wednesday morning. If you want to attend that meeting, I have no problem with it. Uh, at my office at 9 o'clock, uh, the 26th, we'll be having the, the Water Bank Review Committee convene uh, to go through this review. Okay, a little bit of status update on where we're at with our uh, activities for the Water Bank. You can see our progress with the transfers. These are deposit and lease transfers. So water deposited from one location, leased to a new location. In 2019, we had six transfers. Actually, that equates to six deposits, and there were, I believe, eight or nine leases. So the water actually divided up to multiple locations, which is 
kind of an interesting thing this year. For savings accounts, we have a, about 1,500 of them now. Uh, this year we had a, a down year of about 48 new signups uh, coming off of the previous year's very high numbers. I'm not discouraged. I still think if you have any desire in be, being a part of this program, you should. It's about as cheap of an insurance policy, a drought insurance policy as you're going to find. It's $100 to sign up. You save water into your account. That water uh, stays in your account uh, with a 10% trickle every year, but it, it does accumulate, and it's, it's a beneficial program. Okay. If you are interested in uh, water being available in the water bank, we do have a notification system. Uh, we, I encourage you to get on this list to, to be notified of water becoming available. This is the only method we will use to notify you. Uh, so if you have any interest in water moving around, get on these lists. Okay? And for the fun one, uh, we'll now open up for questions. Um, just in a as a matter of time, I want to kind of keep this stuff moving tonight. So let's limit it to one, per, one question per person, uh, just so that everybody has a chance to ask questions. And I w I'm willing to stick around here as long as it takes to answer questions on the side. I, th I think that's beneficial. But in the interest of time, let's limit it to one per person. So I'll go ahead and open it up to, for questions. Hearing none, I'll, I'll pause for a second. Will Minks with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, would you like to get up and say a few words about where we're at with Quivira and the process? Thanks, Oren. Um, I'm Will Meeks with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. First, I need to set a couple things straight. I don't know about Craig and Mike, but I don't often refer to myself as a dignitary, so I'm a, I'm a wayward biologist that just lost my way and ended up in our regional office. Um, but I did want to visit with you a little bit about what we've been doing um, with GMD5 uh, on the Quivira uh, water impairment issue that I know is really, really important to all of you in this, in this room. Uh, I'd like to also extend some thanks to uh, GMD, the, the board for GMD5, specifically Daryl and Fred, for uh, basically asking me to, to come and participate in, um, I guess this is now our third meeting, uh, if you count this fourth, there you go, four of them. Um, and also uh, both uh, uh, the senator's office and the representative's office for engaging in the conversation. So I want to just go ahead and maybe touch on a little bit of timeline stuff and then um, uh, really want to impress on you all how uh, important of an issue this is for the, uh, the Secretary of the Interior and the Director of the Fish and Wildlife Service. So um, you all know what happened last fall when people started contemplating requests for water and, and filing and doing all that type of stuff. And, and, and I understand that, you know, there were probably some pretty heated conversations in here, in this very room about that. Um, at that point in time, I remember having conversations with Mike and others about maybe we have a chance at coming together with something that is mutually beneficial and agreeable and we can move forward without doing something regulatory. Um, one, of the, one of the main emphasis that the Secretary of the Interior, David Bernhard, has is he wants to be a good neighbor. He wants to deregulate. He doesn't want to always use a regulation hammer. Um, and so it was very encouraging to hear the, uh, the department's support in, in allowing us to, to go back to the table and have a conversation with GMD5. I remember the first time we met in December, we, we sat down and uh, um, I think it was Daryl, it could have been Lynn, who said, this is what we've wanted all along. We want to sit down and have a conversation with you, the Fish and Wildlife Service at Quivira, and make sure that we can come to something that's voluntary, um, that's mutually agreeable and beneficial to all parties. Um, I'm a firm believer in relationships and communication. Uh, I'm a firm believer that those relationships start with a handshake and, and that uh, uh, through that trust building and through those kinds of conversations, lots of things are possible. And so. So we're having those conversations now. We're um, uh, still at a very early stage. Uh, as you all know, um, Blue Groundwater has uh, some very high-level modeling stuff. Um, I've directed my folks that work in our Division of Water Resources for the Fish and Wildlife Service to, 
to uh, rally and have a conversation with, with Peter Ballou and his folks and try to understand the modeling a little better so we can drive science to make this decision on how we should move forward. Uh, they're going through that process right now. Um, <clears throat> Mike, as the manager, is trying really hard to make some improvements at the refuge so we can use water better uh, on the refuge. Um, we see that as our con contribution. My role in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, I'm what they call an assistant regional director over the National Wildlife Refuge System and the Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program. So Oren did mention um, um, what's a lot longer than dignitary, but uh, he, he mentioned Aaron, uh, Aaron Flanders with the Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program um, doing some of that phreatophyte removal. Um, I administer that program as well, and so not only are we looking on on-refuge improvements, we're looking for off-refuge engagement with private landowners in a voluntary incentive-based manner. So um, we're looking at all of those things um, in a holistic view for trying to uh, accomplish what I think we're all trying to accomplish. Uh, so to impress upon you kind of the little bit of the urgency and uh, how high level this is, um, Mentioned the secretary, David Bernhardt. He, he personally knows about the issue out here, the Quivira water issue. Um, his assistant secretary of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, Rob Wallace, knows about the issue and is very interested in seeing uh, a successful outcome. Then, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, uh, Aurelia Skipwith, became very engaged in the conversation and she. Um, now is uh, confirmed as our director. Um, she uh, had some, and I'll be very open and candid, one of the, so I work for the executive branch of the government, right? One of the ways that we pay attention, that we really, really sit up straight in our chairs, is when our congressional partners start to ask questions about, well, what are you doing out there in the landscape? How are you trying to do these things? So uh, uh, Ms. Skipwith at the time really engaged in that conversation. She's carried that forward with her as the director. Um, she has personally asked me to be involved in coming to a successful outcome. We have uh, the next several months to do that. Um, so there's urgency, there's uh, resources that we're putting, uh, bringing to bear to try to uh, come to that resolution. And I felt really good after our initial conversations that we could do this. We, we have a good foundation. I can tell we're building that trust. I can also tell that um, we're putting things on the table that we maybe haven't had to haven't had the opportunity to put on the table before. So uh, I'm encouraged. Uh, our technical folks are meeting with uh, the modeler Peter Ballou here on March 17th, um, and then uh, just earlier we're trying to set uh, a follow-up meeting with uh, some folks from GMD5, myself, and others, uh, or in um, the week of April 6th. So um, we're committed. We're uh, making this regular conversation. Um, I know it's all very, very important to you, and um, you know my commitment to you is that we're going to stay in the game and we're going to try to fight hard to come up with a resolution. Thank you, Will. Uh, Will is much more articulate than I am. Um, I know there's some concern about April 6th, that, that week of April 6th. That seems like a long way away, but when you start figuring in the amount of schedules that we have to start accommodating for. The technical folks are still working through the issues all the way through the middle part of March. April 6th is here. I mean, that's basically meeting right now in, in reality. So it doesn't sound like it's very, very near, but it, it actually is. We started putting, looking at our schedule and going, uh, it's looking like April <laughs> really fast. So um, rest assured, this is number one priority for the district. I'm sure, I'm confident it's very high priority for the service as well. So understand that while it doesn't seem like there's been very much progress, it is number one priority, period. End of statement. Um, usually you guys have a lot of questions. So I'm a little bit concerned that you don't and you're being very quiet tonight. Are there any questions at all? Wow. It might be a good question for Will, but uh, you know, up at Shining uh, Bottoms, they've got the retention pits in front of there, you know, uh, water over there. Is that something that has been discussed or anything like that? You know, holding water before it gets into Kavira, so that you can kind of bank that before okay. you know, it gets uh, run off. 
So it's, it's more of a, and I'll rephrase the question for everybody to, to make sure they hear it, not make sure I understood it, and I will kick it over to probably Mike or, or Will, but uh, it's a discussion about with Cheyenne Bottoms, they have their retention pools ahead of their, their uses of that water at Cheyenne Bottoms, and contrast that to how the water manage, is managed at, at Quivira. Is that a fair phrasing? Okay. So they call them retention pits. That's where they store the water and then push it out to their different wetlands. Or best thing I can come up with, but yeah, they're you know basically what it is is they're storing that water before it gets into you know their bees. I got you. And, and I just you know logically it seems like it makes a lot of sense so we can store it wherever we need it when we need it. Push off right, right. Uh, so when when the creek comes in, we pretty much and I. I would say in a loose way we store it in Little Salt Marsh that's right there at the main uh, southern end of the refuge and so from that point on there that's about 932 acres from that point we can disperse it and push it up to the north and you know throughout the 30 or so wetlands that we have. Um, of course Little Salt Marsh only has so much storage capacity we can build it up a little bit but we also consider it habitat and when the birds come in it's a big roosting so we do have some volume for uh, storage there but it's it, it's minimal. It's it's not like a big reservoir or lake or whatever. So uh, we take the opportunity there and store as much as we can when we when we can. So right now we've got a pretty good season. You know we've had a lot of rainfall and we've we've stored some water. And at one point we had our wetlands completely full. Um, we've start we've uh, got birds coming through right now, cranes and geese and ducks and all that. Shorebirds are going to be following. So. Even though we're storing it right now, we'll start pulling it down just a little bit uh, to make use for the habitat for the birds. But that's that's probably our best opportunity right there. Uh, we'll still consider some, you know, storing in the future and how much we can do that at, at Little Salt Marsh. So I don't think we'll be creating any more, but we'll have to wait and see. So. It's got to be one or two more. <laughs> To rephrase, make sure I'm classifying it correctly. Um, have has the district or others looked at the funding opportunities available to it through statute or other means to finance an augmentation project, knowing that it's a huge economic impact to the area or burden to the area, but also has a very key role in in a in a remedy. Is that an accurate statement, John? Bonding issues. Uh, the district has really two avenues primarily in statute. Uh, the first one is our main assessment power. Uh, we can assess up to two dollars per acre foot for water use within the within the district for every water user uh, and up to five cents per acre for every acre within the district. That's two and a half million acres give or take. Uh, and so we are at that capacity right now. You know, we, we, John presented our budget and, and where our assessment rates are going to be. For We're capped out right now for 2020. We're proposing to stay capped out for 2021 as well, pending the July hearing. Uh, secondary to that is uh, the district does have the ability, and I'll defer this to, to the statute, the ability to do well, kind of like star bonds, uh, basically special assessment, special bonding abilities, uh, for special projects. Uh, contrast that to the assessment. The assessments are across the district. Everybody's equal. There's no differential inside district, outside district water user, uh, irrigation, stock water user difference. There's none of that with our general assessment. With the special assessment, however, it's my understanding is that can be targeted to specific areas or water user groups. Um, 
it, it is a bonding capability. So is that where we're going? I don't know. Right now, we know there's going to be some requirements for loans, grant opportunities, those types of things. That's why we're generating the, the revenue we have right now. So that if it is a loan option and finance it completely within the district's capabilities, we want to try and do that because it's the least burden uh, on any single water user group. Um, but as far as what it may look like, one, we don't know how big or what this augmentation well field may look like. We're in the very infant stages of that project. Until you know how big it is or what it may look like, you don't know what the engineering firm is going to cost to construct it. You don't know that cost. You can't go out to anybody and say, we need a loan for this. We need to apply for this grant because you don't know what the structure looks like. And so until we know that, we just can't do it. It's the same thing you heard me say last year. We're, we're still there. We are further along in the aug augmentation project. We are conducting our initial phase of site drilling to better assess what the water quality and quantity is in that proposed area. Uh, but until we know those, that data set, know those numbers, we don't, we're not going to be able to go to an engineering firm and get a, a quality quote from them to know what this, this beast is going to look like. In the long and short of it, any, any other critique or addition, John? Well, the Starbond the deal, we looked into it several years ago when we were trying to, we initially talked about doing augmentation just by working out lease arrangements with individual producers and pump their water to the creek. And basically, it, it, not only can we issue the star bonds, we can raise an assessment to amortize the star bonds in answer to what you're asking. And uh, but then the other thing that probably ought to be at least addressed is Kent Moore, wherever Kent went. Uh, why, why don't you just, would you make... Yeah, I'm Kent Moore, uh, northwest part of Pratt County. Uh, currently serve as president of Waterpack, and I think what John's referring to is that purpose of our organization has always been to be a proactive voice for irrigated agriculture. I mean, that's that's what we decided it was in the basement of, of the Maxfield Bank, early 1990s. So, what our focus has been throughout this process is, and especially since we've had more of a of a focus on how are we going to achieve augmentation or, or achieve conservation ma measures um, related to Quivira is how do we pay for these things. And we've identified some ways that we think that we can set up entities. Uh, we're in the process right now of setting up a 501c3 that would serve as a vehicle to um, consolidate funding, whether that funding came from a governmental source or from private uh, sources to have the capacity to be able to uh, maybe even in a partnership with GMD5 um, uh, using some of their uh, bonding uh, authority, but come up with ways that, as R Richard Winshamoy says, is that you know if we can figure out a way to do these things successfully and not tax ourselves to death doing it um, and have the most minimal impact that we can on our area's economy, uh, that's what we want to try to achieve. And so we've, we've been uh, uh, trying to identify those types of programs and take the steps necessary to implement them when the time came. And uh, I, guess I, I guess I would say, you know, five months ago, I think, the, I think the actual date of the letter was September the 20th or 30th or whatever, uh, was the day you got your letter of uh, proposed direct administration. So, you know, uh, keep that in the back of your mind. I mean, that, that this issue is still very much on uh, of, of urgent nature. Uh, we have an opportunity here uh, with, the, with the GMD-5 and, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service setting at the table to, I think, come up with a, 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 a solution. You know, I think everybody out here has always felt like there is a solution uh, attainable and achievable and, and doable. Um, but it's up to us to uh, identify those things and make it happen. And um, I've, I've been real encouraged with the, with the tone of the meetings from the reports that I've had and heard and, and uh, seen from those. Um, it's going well. I uh, really am encouraged about the direction it's headed. 
I think there's absolutely sincere interest on both parties to figure out how to achieve these things and um, for, the good of, uh, for the good of our communities. I mean, we know the importance of, of what, what that uh, water means to us and our farms and our communities and our schools and region as a whole. And I mean, that's been Water Pack's focus from day one, is, is recognizing that and doing the things necessary uh, to ensure that we have that for generations to come. One last call for questions as a group. Mike? I know that Jeff wants to get up and talk real quick, but I'll steal another two or three minutes from him. So I think everybody heard a while ago when Will was talking about improvements and stuff on the refuge and what we're going to think about doing, but I just want to share this opportunity and let everybody know what we had done in the past years. And so um, if, if everybody kind of remembers years back when we were going through the Rattlesnake Creek Partnership 2000 through, through 2012, um, I can report that during that time the improvements we made then were basically filling in the barrows, the really deep areas of our wetlands and making them a lot shallower so they were more water efficient. We did, I believe, 12 wetlands between 2000 and 2014. So I got here in 12 and I was able to finish on the last two wetlands of those, so I think that was a pretty good move towards uh, a little bit of water efficiency. And Oren, when you mentioned a while ago about Rattlesnake Creek and 30 miles and what's going on west of the refuge, I can tell you right now that we've got about 20 miles um, of Rattlesnake Creek on the refuge, and the refuge is about 14 miles long, so that's exactly how far 20 miles goes, so imagine 30 miles. Uh, but we've been able to, since 2014, um, get onto Rattlesnake Creek and either remove or treat or control salt cedar, rush and olive right there along the creek through that entire length of 20 some miles. And we've gone out to the extent of you know about 30, 40, 50 feet so we, we took from 2014 to now to do it. Starting this fall we plan on going out 400 feet and we're going to do it again, and we're just going to keep going back and, and, and cutting back in a little bit, making sure we're keeping the invasives off the creek. So those are two uh, uh, big improvements that we've been making, and we've, we've got more to think about and more to do. So just to let everybody know kind of what we've done so far. All right, Jeff, you want to... We'll just go ahead and keep on moving on through the agenda, so. I'm, I'm going to go off the reservation a little bit, but um, if, you, uh, if you look out in the Pawnee Valley, this is something that um, I'm a geologist by trade, and and I thought this was really interesting, but um, you'll see like several seven foot, five foot, six foot rises out in the Pawnee Valley. Well, we continue those measurements out and, uh, into uh, Hodgman County along the Pawnee River and um, Buckner Creek. Anyway, what's, uh, what I think's going on there, and I think it's a pretty good bet, is uh, Horse Thief Reservoir has been filling up See, now, normally when we get a big rainfall out there, we'll get a flood surge and, it, and it's gone. And um, anyway, Horse Thief Reservoir has been filling up the last three years at different times. It's spilling a good portion of the year. And I think that's what's going on in those uh, big water level rises. I think it's happening also. And, and it's not just Horse Thief Reservoir. It's the, uh, it's the watershed district dams up there that are, that are helping this process out. So anyway, that's kind of cool. Um, I, most of you guys already know me, but I'm uh, Jeff Lanterman. I'm the water commissioner for the Stafford Field Office. Uh, there are four field offices in the state, and I have about 26 counties in South Central Kansas. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of stuff besides uh, what happens in GMD5. 
So I, I got to say that I've had probably one of the most interesting years of my career. Um, uh, I just uh, kind of want to let everybody know a little bit what it, what we do at the field office. So you know, this is we have to count beans, you know. Um, so I do that. So um, I have one person. Um, she's brand new, uh, working new applications in my office. Uh, Jessica Engelbrecht. Um, anyway, um, if anybody you know, mostly outside of GMD five, uh, needs assistance with, with a new application. Uh, she's the one that's helping fill them out, and she's also processing them in, the, in our office. Um, also, um, Orrin talked about the, the water bank savings accounts. Uh, the chief engineer delegated to me the authority to um, be able to approve those things. So um, anyway, I guess you go down to Orrin, uh, get your deposit slip if you need some, and um, I can approve it there generally, you know, while you're in the office. So uh, to where you can access the water in your savings account. Um, it was pretty wet last year, so we only had five of those. Um, uh, one of the things that we do is uh, compliance investigations on uh, various points of diversion, place of use, all the, all the permits and everything, complaints to... Um, uh, on proposed certificates, generally, um, I have uh, one person that does uh, field inspections. That's like a process in uh, certification of your water rights. Um, so I did 62 of those last year, and then um, then we write all that up and propose a certificate uh, that the chief engineer was, will eventually sign and uh, uh, create your real property right there. Um, uh, we did 81 uh, field office uh, processable changes. That's when uh, somebody uh, wants to redrill a well or change a place of use. Um, I have the ability to um, uh, uh, prove a change application to redrill a well up to a half mile away and uh, change irrigation places of use. Uh, we had... Um, 672 customers in the office over the last year uh, that required some sort of action. Uh, generally, that's pretty easy, you know, like a file review, but a lot of them are like water use reports and stuff, and all. Um, that's coming up, so. Um. Oh, um, one thing I wanted to talk about is um, uh, one of the, the last two administrations, uh, Brownback and um, Governor Kelly want to want us to go paperless, so um, we're working on um, scanning all of our water right files. Now I have 14,000 of them. Uh, we just finished all of our closed files. Um, everything that's been dismissed or closed, uh, those are going to eventually go to the shredder. And um, working on regular water right files uh, now as we speak every day. Um, I will not let those be shredded. Um, they'll have to tear them from my hands. Um, I talked about the change applications that we did. Um, I kind of called out um, GMD5 there. Um, change applications last year in 2019 were really down. I don't know if it was uh, commodity prices or something that drove that, but I only did uh, uh, 30 change applications inside GMD5 last year. Um, so what are we going to be working on um, coming up? Um, we hope to, I've been kind of short staffed, so I hope to um, uh, do more compliance work, which is uh, something that we consider a core mission. Um, hopefully um, there will be some uh, actionable items on the three big issues in my field office. Um, I, I talked about interesting projects. So I've been really involved in the uh, Wichita ASR uh, permit modification process and, and that permitting there. Um, anyway, um, I was in um, two weeks ago, three days worth of hearings, and we got five more days worth of hearings coming up in uh, March. So um, what they're asking to do, well, I won't go into ASR. That's a, that's a whole presentation in itself. But if you're, if you're interested in it, come up to me afterwards, and I'll talk to you about it. Um, the Hayes change application, I don't have anything to add uh, from what Oren said. I do know that tomorrow there's a deadline um, to get um, 
additional motions uh, for additional agent uh, additional admissions to the agency record so I don't know um, uh, I, I just got an update from our chief legal officer on that um, and uh, career impairment um, we are very hopeful uh, for applications on augmentation and uh, the field office is uh, standing ready uh, Jessica or Matt will help fill out applications when you get to that point so um, and, and again we're gonna continue to scan water act files um, this is just um, you know uh, they say how do you eat an elephant uh, one bite at a time so I have uh, six people in my office and 14,000 water right files in 26 counties or all the parts of 26 counties so we have a lot of work um, the 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 big group of uh, of wells down in uh, Sedgwick County Cali County and Sumner County that was all a uh, uh, water meter order so we have to get down there and check a whole bunch of meters um, that, that was the last meter order in my uh, field office so my uh, my field office is uh, completely metered now um, I, MDS administration is something that DWR does um, you know pretty regularly on a regular basis um, I usually do it um, on the Walnut River um, down, out in El Dorado and I do it you know a lot on the Little Ark and uh, some on the Ninesca down south and um, anyway um, it's not something that we do a lot on uh, groundwater wells but um, with the modeling and everything that was done in the Rattlesnake Creek and the proposed administration there there was a lot of concern well uh, we got some uh, concerns from uh, water users about MDS wells in the basin so um, anyway we've been evaluating the model and alternatives for MDS administration on the Rattlesnake Creek using the GMD5 model um, to determine water rights uh, junior to MDS which is April of 1984 so every water right that was put in place uh, junior to that April of 1984 um, is junior to MDS and with a quick response to the stream um, the resulting proposed area for MDS includes approximately 20 water rights um, generally within a mile of Rattlesnake Creek and this is going to be both Zenith and Maxville have um, MDS so we're evaluating both of those gauges um, this week um, you know we met with the chief engineer he was he was going to have to come up with a plan for this and um, we made a, a decision that we are not ready and uh, to administer MDS in the Rattlesnake Creek yet so um, one of the things that uh, made our decision was with all the uh, significantly above average precipitation over the last two years uh, the basins temporarily temporarily recovered and we can uh, reasonably expect uh, sufficient stream flows through the spring and summer uh, at those two gauges so and uh, also um, we we do met, we do administer groundwater rights for MDS in the Republican River um, so we wanted to come up in the Republican River when we do that uh, we have a consent agreement that uh, that water users who have MDS wells can enter into with a division of water resources that gives them a little bit of flexibility instead of just uh, strict on off uh, during MDS administration so we're uh, working on uh, uh, something that's going to be tailored towards the Rattlesnake Creek um, if and when we do do um, uh, MDS administration um, but um, the bottom line is uh, from the chief engineer given the strong impact of groundwater pumping on the Rattlesnake Creek as uh, stream flows shown by the GMD model it is our belief that without uh, continued wet conditions um, MDS, MDS administration will have to uh, probably be occur in the future all right um, uh, water use reports are uh, coming due so they're due March 1st um, I wanted to uh, point out um, something to this group um, if you look um, we had a problem with the printer this year so how who all has uh, turned in their water use reports this year 
quite a few. Um, we had a problem at the printer. So, um, and it has to do with the pin number as you go to enter it in. Uh, lots of times there is a space there in between the third and the fourth digit. So in, in this case, the pin number would be 1234, and then the person ID would be 56789, as shown here. So uh, just be aware of that. And, and uh, of course, the, the field office always um, helps with uh, water use reports. So if, if you need any help, uh, give us a call. So um, with that, I think that's all I had. I think we're at the we're, I think we're at the right side of that now. <laughs> we're filling the aquifer back up, which is a good place to be. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I do want to make a mention of a few things that uh, water use reporting for water bank. If you are a participant with a water bank, we would require a, a copy of that water use report that is submitted to the state, uh, and that is due by March one as well. So if you've not got that to us yet, and you've already submitted to the state. Come talk to us, and we can help you get that uh, get that recovered for our, for our needs. Um, John, actually, I need to make mention of this. John Hildebrand and Devin Cooper in my office do an excellent job of keeping me on track. Uh, John handed me a note because I forgot to mention our vendors around the room. Um, we have a micrometer back in the back corner, uh, Aqua Spy and the Soil Moisture Probes back in the other other corner, rigs irrigation with their in flush system, uh, trellis moisture probes, yeah, as you can see right over here, uh, channel seed, yeah, there you are, uh, and then uh, crop quest with water meter log. And I, I mentioned crop quest last, not, not for any special reason other than uh, I agreed that we, we give him a little bit of time to present a, an interesting program that they're running throughout the district. So I'll turn it over to Nathan. Thank you, oh, great. Uh, Yeah, my name's Nathan Woodjack. I'm the Precision Ag Manager for CropQuest. And uh, actually, John, he reached out a while ago and asked me to come in and just visit with you all a little bit about uh, our water management services and more specifically the technology that we're trying to integrate into it. Um, Let's jump right into that. And then I'll also get into the specifics of a, a promo that we're going to do with GMD5. So uh, as far as, uh, from, from our perspective, these are some of the technologies that are newer that help with the crop irrigation. Uh, soil, soil texture mapping, you guys probably know that. Uh, and I'll be brief as I go through these things. But you probably know it as Varus EC or Dual EM. Um, basically going to give you a sand, silt, clay. Uh, look of that field. Now, that took us over into variable rate irrigation. So, soil texture mapping has been around a while, but we moved into variable rate irrigation to make better use of that. So, because we know the, the, the soil texture, we know the water holding capacities, um, and potentially the infiltration rate on those different soils. And, and to keep it real simple, we can speed those pivots up in different areas out in the field to try to help it match those different soil textures. <clears throat> and that took us over into elevations and slopes and those things. So we know that water infiltrates a little bit differently on those areas and, and led us into the drainage solutions. So when we got into that, we saw you know there's mud holes out in some of these fields and how do we reclaim some of those areas? We weren't able to do it, you know, not completely with the barrel rate irrigation. But there's some other tools that we can use there. Uh, in addition with our partnering with Modern Ag, they help us to design those. Uh, all the while in the background, our developers were building water meter log. And so water meter log is a tool that, that we use, uh, well, actually, you guys could use, uh, that helps you with your allotment. <clears throat> and there's a couple here at the bottom that I wanted to mention. These are newer tools that we've just uh, released. Smart pivot monitoring actually is released and it's out and water probes is something I'm just going to put a teaser out there. Um, just keep an eye out there. I think you'll you'll have some more information coming from CropQuest over the, the next month or so. 
but smart pivot monitoring, real quick, what it is, we take an aerial image, and that aerial image is very detailed, uh, 15 centimeter accuracy, and in that image is a thermal band, so that's what you're seeing up here in the pivot, there's a thermal band. Now, once we get that image, we can upload it to the cloud, and it processes it, runs it through its algorithms, and it'll tell you where those nozzle issues are at. It'll also identify the opposite too. So if you have a nozzle that is broken off, a hose is popped off, it can show you those spots at the same time. So just some new tech that's coming, and it sends it right to you as a, an email. So. <clears throat> now, in 2020, if you guys are, are interested, we're, we're doing this promo with GMD5. So if you go to watermeterlog.com, now, Water Meter Log is just a, a website. You can get to it from your phone or your iPad, but it's meant to help you track your allocation. A couple of key points. When we were building this thing, we wanted two, two real main key points. And one was we wanted it to be fast. So day-to-day -day use had to be really quick out in the field. We didn't want anybody messing around. And so, you know, it's basically when you get to the meter uh, or a hired man or something like that goes past the meter, including... The consultant, if you guys choose, he could help you with it. Uh, they entered the amount into that, in, into that page. <clears throat> and the other key point for us was being able to keep everyone in the loop on these allocations. And so, as the as the producer, you guys can choose who you choose to you know want to share that information with. You might want to send it to your employees, your landlords. Uh, Hopefully, from our perspective, we'd love you to share it with the consultants. Uh, but again, you wouldn't have to. Uh, it just helps us all to be in the, on the same page, make good decisions. And so, if, if you guys, you know, I, I guess I'd, I'd suggest uh, taking a look at watermeterlog.com sometime. If you want, go ahead and sign up for it. And then, if you will, please send an email to support at cropquest.com and just someplace in that email mention GMD5. Uh, we'll take care of the rest to make sure you guys get the full, full blown version. That's all I had. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, I will say, uh, John in our office has been using Water Meter Log, kind of testing it out for some of the wells that we monitor. And I'm not going to speak for John, but from a little bit of, I know about it. It is very fast. It, it will give you up to date uh, a dial reading of where are you at in your total allotment of water for the year. You can set it up with single year allocations, but multi year allocations, and we can help you work out some of the details of how that works. Uh, but this is this is a cool deal. If you look closely, you'll notice that enterprise level pricing is usually $500. They're given a promo code. Anybody in GMD5 can use that promo code and get that free. That's significant, guys. Unlimited meters, unlimited meter ratings, team management, all for no cost if you enter that promo code. If you don't have another mechanism to do this type of, of measurement, I highly encourage you to, to look into this. Uh, this is not a paid, uh, I'm not a paid spokesman. Okay. Um, Let's see, I um, know I'm missing something else in here. No, I think we're good. Uh, Keith, we'll have Keith Miller uh, go ahead and keep us, get us back onto the agenda and we'll move forward. Keith? Thank you. Um, I have the privilege of serving on the uh, rack for this area. The rack was developed by this uh, governor, Brownback, for his 50 year water plan. What we actually do is we are a regional advisory committee. So what we do is we look at the issues that are affecting each and every one of you for water quality, water volume, anything to do with water, we talk about it. And there's about 12 people that's on this committee. And we meet throughout the year. And in fact, we're having a meeting Monday afternoon and Monday evening at 4 o'clock in the uh, convention center in Great Bend, 
we are having a public meeting for the RAC. And what that's for is so that you guys can come in and give us ideas what we should be working on and what problems you guys see that's going on. Um, right now we have five or six goals that we have been working on for the last few years. And let me first of all say that our current governor is completely on board with doing the water plan that we are working on. Uh, she is uh, in complete support. She actually come to the last water authority meeting that was held about two weeks ago in Topeka and told us that, that she is in complete support. She realizes that water is one of the most important things to everyone that's in this room and everyone that lives in this community. So we are going to try and rework those goals that we had, make them pertinent to the area that we have today. I can tell you uh, we're not proceeding with all the goals till we see what gets worked out with the rattlesnake because a lot of the goals that we had are affected by that decision. So that will be put off till we hear back from them. But once that decision is made between the RAC and the GMD, you will see us as the RAC disseminating the information as far and wide as we can to each and every one of you and answering as many questions as we have. That's what the purpose of this committee is, is to attack any issues that we have with water in our area. So I'm new at this. As the chairman, I was appointed in December, but uh, look forward to serving you uh, for the next couple years and trying to make sure that our voices are heard when the Water Authority meets. Thank you, Keith. Um, pay attention to what's going on in the water if you're not. Uh, you got your attendance here, obviously, you guys are concerned about it, but your neighbors are not, may not be here tonight. Make sure that everybody is aware of what's going on in water, because what's happening here is a precedent for other parts of the state. What's happening ever, elsewhere is a precedent for what could happen here. You know, Jeff was, was uh, discussing the, what they're doing, the Republican and, and the MDS administration there. It's a precedent setter for how they could do it in the Rattlesnake or other areas. Um, what we're doing and working out with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service with a uh, resolution to the impairment. It's a precedent setter for what may happen elsewhere with impairments in this. Um, water moves slowly, but the ideas of, for water uh, don't move slowly. They will pass around like crazy. Um, one of my things, um, the reason I do this, it's not to not not for a job. It's so that future generations have use of the water. If you look at take a look at the water bank's logo, I take that very seriously. That is our charge: preserve water for future generations. That's why we're here. If we're not doing something that you feel we should be doing, talk to us. If we're doing something right, let us know. We see you guys a lot of times when, when something's going wrong. But if we're doing something like, right, let us know so we know that we're on the right track. Because we don't always hear that. Talk to John. John will get it back to me. I'll get it back to the board. Give us a call. Stop by our office. We're more than happy to, to discuss, cuss or discuss, whatever issue you may have. Seriously, guys. That's why we're here. We're here to be a steward, a, a, a representative to you when we go talk to the state house, when we go talk to various agencies, we're, we are your voice. If we're not doing it right, you need to let us know. At this point, I don't have anything else on the agenda since the elections went really quickly. Um, anybody, any of the board members want to say anything tonight? No? With that, I would... Uh, I guess entertain options for adjournment for both Water Bank and for Big Bend. John, do I have a second? 
Ron? Oh, yes, Jeff? Yes, uh, yes, thank you, Jeff. Uh, if you're unaware, uh, Chief Engineer David Barfield announced his retirement uh, effective next Friday, uh, February 28th. Uh, we found out this afternoon Secretary of Agriculture has named the acting chief engineer will be Chris Badel. Uh, so that goes into effect, I guess, effective on his retirement on the 28th. So um, that's the latest, latest news from Manhattan. I have a motion for adjournment. Are anybody opposed? All right. We're adjourned. Thank you, folks. Safe travels.